um, my theme for being at this conference was I give you my word. And I was inspired by it from my practice in the discipline of wording life, giving life meaning. And it may not just be a literal speech, but anything that could hold the essence of creativity. So it could just be a prayer in what was said today about pouring libation, just a simple intention for what gives form to consciousness. And I've been in a practice of ceremonial order, meaning to witness the processes that brings reality to be what they are. From the unconscious levels, how people experience life through unconscious modes of realities. Or what we call the superconscious, the collective consciousness. So I've had a practice for what, 20 years in phenomenology, which would be observing something becoming. And also on the other side of it, dissolving, leaving the world of existence. That includes a human being. I've set in the transition points of someone from life into death and hold the space for the continuity of their soul life after death. And for the newborn, those who are preparing to come into the world, um, some of them send their mothers to me in particular. <laughs> 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 to like, tell her I'm coming. Even sometimes tell her the date when I'm coming. And that becomes quite interesting, you know, the doctors give them a due date, and I said, the baby said no. <laughs> a few days later. So there's an interesting thing that there are communications that happen that we could be receptive to. And I've just been quite interested in being receptive to communications that happen from my own internal processes, which would be for me, the deepest would be my soul level of coherence, and then um, mental or imaginative pictures about moving things from possibility to probability to actuality, or to work with the field of human beings and other beings that have their own ways of sharing what is theirs to live from. And so that's been my practice for, for a couple of decades. And then I was just make myself available for what has to be done with that insight. And so I had um, an interest in medicine. So I wanted to apply as much as what I knew to healing the human being from illness. And then I encountered a dear friend who had um, contracted HIV AIDS and at that time, and this was um, early 90s, 92, and he was on a pathway where it was quite obvious that he may not recover from that condition, but are there other levels of consciousness to be recovered? And so I shared that path for three years with him and it led me to my um, other work, which is to hold the space, um, as I just spoke to, of communications that happened from that other realm. And then went into some formal initiation of working with the dead that comes out of my lineage of practice that was introduced here into the United States in the 1800s by a mystic whose work it was to support, um, at that time the president was Abraham Lincoln, to support him to understand the future of black souls in America and to help him come to the decision of emancipating slavery 
from a spiritual conception. Abraham Lincoln was a member of his spiritual school in understanding the phenomena behind um, what was at that time the war, the Civil War, but more so the dead of the Civil War. What is it that they're contributing to the ecology of this country, this continent, spiritually, and what in the human blood gets utilized by the collective consciousness of, we say, the nation and the world. So out of that lineage, um, I met my teacher in Los Angeles in 1991, who studied in, from the 1920s to the 1960s the transmutation of this energy from the emancipation of slavery through Reconstruction through the Harlem Renaissance, through the Western migration, Southern migration to the Western states, and then eventually the civil rights movement impulse. And then, of course, we say um, being engaged with how do we negotiate um, the collapses that we're seeing now in, the, in our world. So I've been in that study with with that tradition called Gnosis. And um, that's why I'm here to talk <laughs> about some of this stuff. <laughs> so I thank you for being a witness to my own um, work and life. And I invite us to think into this space and see what's alive for us. And there's a microphone that will be passed if there's a point of sharing that you would like to make, and please. Well, actually, a couple of directions, but I think I want to take the first one because of what you said, is that um, I'm, you're focused on words, that words have so much power. And as a spiritual teacher myself, one of the things I try to do is when I talk to people about moving towards love and away from chaos and disconnection, I try to use those words rather than what I find is a traditional talking about moving towards the light and away from the dark. That, um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to that, especially, you know, given the lineage and, you know, the roots with the Civil War and emancipation and as somebody of darker skin, do you notice that in terms of our language? Um, you know, the spiritual language. It feels like there's an embedded racism in our use of light and dark, and I'd be interested in your comments. Thank you. Um, from how we approach it, it's not light and dark, it's light within the dark. Darkness holds light. And if one could dissolve the perception of light, it comes right back into darkness. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the paradigm of our current um, consciousness is that we needed light to become aware of certain things. So light is actually a transducer of energies that create in, a, in our cells, a receptive, transformative um, energy to behold ideas. So light give us ideas. You know, it's like, wow, I got an enlightened experience. And so it's a communication from beings within the realm of darkness. And darkness became negative because people became afraid of it more and more. Um, and that's more of a loss of the power of consciousness to be in uncertainty, be in, it will say, the, the, the inner life itself, not the outer life. And so when we say about the soul, the soul is a dark place. And if anyone is to go into the deeper 
recesses of consciousness. Um, it extinguishes what we know, because you can't carry knowing into it. You can only carry your will into it. So one has to be willing to become a kind of seer, sensing from consciousness. You create what you know, need to know. There's no inheritance when you go into that place. So the, the paradigm that, that we have come into this conflict with light and dark is in the intellectual schools, whereby the, the, the archetypes withdrew from the information that most people would utilize for defining the paradigm of their reality. It, res it re rescinded from the visible world, the archetypes. And so um, it was Carl Jung or others who tried to point human beings again to the depth of psychology to say, go beyond the fears and, and um, pathologies of what we live from and go into the darkness again uh, within our own lives and rectify this impulse. Yes, when we project our own fears on people, they become the darker thing in the world. They become the shadow of the light that we want to choose for ourselves. And we've done that with cultures, we've done that with other kinds of beings in the world. Um, the snake has gotten a bad rap for a long time. <laughs> that it, it, it is, because it stays so close to the ground and actually go into the earth to bring our consciousness there. And so whatever places we were afraid of things, we made it dark because that was where we were initiated and no one wants to be consciously initiated because we have to give up what we know and turn to the unknown. And so when the intellectual consciousness began to define pathways of knowledge, it went from initiation to education. And then education wasn't so much to draw out of the soul what it had, it meant to put into consciousness what, it, what others thought we should have. And so the, the pathway moved from initiation to education of bringing out of the soul to education putting into the soul. And we left with a conflict of no longer appreciating darkness. And there are people who live with that in the, in the exercise of trying to purify that with their lives, experiences, and bring more creativity, regardless of how dark it gets, they bring light back or bring consciousness back to it, please. Spirit wisdom. <clears throat> I, I have been recently experiencing what you mean about allowing darkness and kind of finding comfort in that space. Like sometimes I'll like try to practice with my eyes closed or certain things to, oh, to allow um, myself to feel, to find comfort in discomfort. And um, like you said, there, as a black person in a predominantly Caucasian space, I find myself, um, I have trouble connecting sometimes with the people around me. And it's not really like there's not a want for, t for connection. It's just, I don't almost, I don't really feel a connection with this source. And so I, I have a yoga teacher and I was trained in a predominantly Caucasian space and I learned a lot from these people and I did connect deeply but still taking my practice out into the world, I didn't feel the same connection that my teachers felt with the classroom. And um, I just want, 
I've been trying to better understand and I know that I have my own trauma and ancestral trauma from white supremacy. So I find myself in spaces where I'm not really angry, but I feel a guard almost. And I don't really, and I, I don't want to have that guard, but I also have been practicing on releasing it, but it's been um, difficult sometimes. It takes a few things and then I'll, I'll kind of share together. So let's pass the mic for a while. Mine is on a slightly different note, but I don't think unrelated. Um, I want to go back to some of your earlier statements about your training. And um, particularly the notion about Lincoln and the slaves and ending slavery and relate that to the discussions we were having in here yesterday with, with Thomas Hubel about collective trauma. And he was saying that in order to heal collective trauma, there has to be ethical correction. And it's not to dispute anything that you've said, but my understanding of history, I find it difficult to perceive Abraham Lincoln as ending slavery. <laughs> you know, that the Emancipation Proclamation was a, a tool of war, and it even says that in the beginning, and it didn't end all slavery, it just did it for the areas, not even the states, because it didn't necessarily have to be the whole state, but what, whatever region was in rebellion. And it wasn't initiated initially. I mean, it was held very strategically, and he's even quoted as saying, if he could win this war without letting anybody out, you know, he wouldn't do it. And we didn't really fight this war, the Civil War, to end slavery. We fought it to stop the spread of it for like economic reasons. And, and I'm bringing that up to say that I think we've got this narrative going on in this nation about how we ended slavery like some moral thing, but we, we never did. And even in the 13th Amendment that still allows for involuntary incarceration for crimes, which has led to this whole criminal justice complex mass incarceration thing that we have. And, 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 I, and my question here is, how do we ever, not how do we ever, because I'm doing it all my life. Uh, we both do social justice work. But what, particularly, what, what is it gonna take for us to get to that point of the ethical correction around this? As Thomas Hubel said, we, had to, we have to change like the underlying consciousness, like the underlying causation. But as long as we keep this story about like we've done it, and that's just the past without this understanding of now being, you know, convergence of past, present, and future, with, 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 with your understanding, how would you say is a good way for us to move forward towards the understanding of the ethical correction that needs to happen in consciousness. Appreciate it very much. we we'll take a couple more and then I'll weave it together. Thank you. Um, building on those, I have a brief comment to add around the snake. I'm glad you brought in snake medicine. Um, so I wanted to share something briefly about that and then ask a question that's related and is also connecting some of the, weaving some of the threads in here that my sisters to my right um, mentioned. So for those, in some traditions, particularly several North American indigenous traditions, um, the snake has the power of transmutation. So not only does it go dark to the earth and it is embedded within the earth and willing to look toward that darkness, but it sheds its skin and is often considered a symbol of transmutation. So it's powerful that you brought that up and it reflects the language you already brought forth. So 
I'm curious, you outlined um, the transmute that we've had this initiation and then this education system and sort of a perversion and, and hinted to the fact that transmutation is needed. So I'm curious if you could speak to, in the healing of this collective pain, I think a lot of us are seeking real answers, answers that get at that ethical correction, answers that help to help us feel rooted in those spaces rather than feeling like I'm trying and I'm connecting but there's still a guard. Um, and so I'm curious about what do you see as maybe, is it a, because I've been playing with this, like is, are we not playing, exploring with, am I re-indigenizing myself? Am I going back to those initiations? Are there new initiations for this time? If it's not education, what is the deep learning that needs to happen individually and collectively? So if you could speak to that, that would be awesome. Yes. Thank you for everything you've shared. Yeah. One, one more and then I'll, I can take four and then we can think into. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, uh, maybe it's loosely related. Um, it's just been weighing so heavy on me and your comments yesterday about sitting with someone for a couple of weeks and then into a month or more. Um, maybe wanted to bring it here. The, it's been weighing on me the, um, the involuntary uh, incarceration of uh, people who have the, the results of trauma uh, in the mental health system. Uh, and it's just gone, it, it's, like, it's like the new form of slavery where the results of trauma morph into what are labeled disorders and the trauma is never addressed. It's just ignored and, you know, you know, medicated, ignore the trauma, um, create, you know, billions for each drug company, ignoring the, the problem. And there's just, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, there's this ethical kind of thing that's not being addressed here that, that we're allowing this to happen. Um, and, and now in almost every state we have involuntary uh, outpatient, involuntary in the community commitment be required to be medicated and ignore dealing with the trauma. Um, and, you know, and it's just, I, I don't know where else to, to bring it. Yeah, thank you. Yesterday I asked the question, where did, where did all the things that have happened in histories go? Where is history for us? And so this is the, the, the research that I took up. We have an informational realm where history is kept in records of written texts, stories, oral and written stories of what happened. When something happens, it goes through consciousness and goes into the earth. All of our, goes into the earth. Meaning the earth is here for all that has happened, all that could happen, or if it is here. So when we think of history, it's not going back, it's going down. Going down into the place whose wisdom it is to transmute that experience, re-enliven it, and give it back to us. History is not gone, it's right here, being re-engaged with the life energy we call the etheric body, the life body that animates our physical body, is right here again. What did not become conscious falls into the unconscious, and reappear again 
as a new day. It's a phenomena. So what happens, happened in certain time before now, is the earth principle. It's fact, we could say, yes, that is true, it happened that way. The water element in consciousness says, well, what has happened since then? So this is the alchemy of consciousness I'm speaking to. Nothing remains fact based on the law of creation. Everything that was fact will be brought into creation again because we are alive. And the human being is responsible for transmutation of all of the elements in the alchemical wheel of consciousness. So the water element, what happens since whatever in history? The next cycle of the wheel, how is it reappearing now? This is the one, say, the air element in the collective field. Who is all the people that was before? How do we know that one of us or many of us are not those same people again? Do we, do we really want to know what happened with history? How it reappears as current reality? There's a little five-year-old girl that I saw on a news feed. She loves Lincoln. She dresses up with his hat and beard. And one can ask, okay, why? She collects everything, Lincoln, coins and, and she was being interviewed, like, what is this about? And it was as if she is utilizing an inner picture of some being that is not historical, we know it and know the personality from history. But what she's utilizing is a different field. She's five years old. She can recite the Gettysburg Address, from, but not as history. So we can say, I, I, I'm coming to like, what lives in us? How does the memory of something that happened before come to us and what does it do? with our life experience. Again, the intellectual consciousness separates the field of reality that something happened some time ago from me who could wake it up again and review it and see what could have happened, add that to it, in my own consciousness. History is not finished, I agree. No history is finished because it's in us. We brought it back to life. To, to complete the next phase of it. Why? Because the earth is recycling everything including human beings and our stories. It's not just we recycle plastic. The ecology of nature lives in the ecology of human consciousness, moving it from personal to collective all the time. And the, the experience is the transmutation happens at the level in which all that I personally know becomes united with all that you personally know 
to become a different kind of reality. So it's not wrong or right why I listen to a number of questions because it is not different questions. It is about whether or not we are willing to listen to each other and have the collective question and answer that. <laughs> it's our time to say we are actually trying to divine who knows what about everything as a collective process and then utilize that knowing. And so I speak to your, 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 your the feeling of separation from the practice. And it's interesting to see the yoga consciousness emerging again. But where does it really lead? What does it lead to as where we are now? You know, it's um, the rishis, the rishis prepared human beings to deconstruct the dream time. Mm. Right? The ancient rishis in preparation for the Kali Yoga age the yoga traditions was to give human beings a way to wake up from dream and to understand the laws of incarnating the ceremonial world. And interesting that this is a time in which our sleep time will be where the yoga happens, the real yoga happens in sleep, not in the practice. Practice is only to create enough energy in the kundalini of the transmutational power to wake up into the superconscious again and transmute the histories of waking up and forgetting the soul. That is in the darkness that we will be initiated again, not in this trying to answer questions in all of our intelligences. It is in sleep that we awake. And that's what all these yoga schools could lead to. <laughs> if understanding what Kali Yoga was as a preparation. So there, there, be, before the intellectual consciousness school, most of the intelligences of the prior civilizations went into preparing the body, the organs, for being able to receive higher frequencies. So Egyptian and Indian civilizations were to give the human being constructs that we carry now to even resurrect from the dead. And I'll say that to even resurrect from the dead, the, the, the Isis mysteries of creating the first conception without the male part is in our DNA. A future still waiting to happen. Histories in the cosmologies of what initiated human beings are not static. It's a current of recreations and larger stories, more complex stories, but nevertheless lived by the human experience. And so, yes, I don't give uh, Lincoln credit for all of that happened. In fact, he could not fulfill what was needed. Yet, in a certain way, he marked a time in which the process started and started and began to move towards others who will fulfill the idea. And so I'm hoping that we will not take history literally, but energetically, so that we could move creation back. I was just given the one minute appointment <laughs> that we have to close and um, I hope this will be an invitation to not just bring this theme back to, to sand, but wherever we are. And I'm open if there are still things to pursue in the, in the discourse. 
uh, I'll take all my calls. So give me a call, or send me an email, and I would love to be in conversation um, as we continue on. But I appreciate this beginning of our time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.